Welcome to Awakening Within. I'm your host, Jill McPherson. If you're a parent, you'll want to listen in. Are you concerned about how much screen time your child is experiencing in a day? Do you find it almost impossible to get them to put a device down or walk away from a screen? Well, today, my guest, Elaine Yuskowski, is here to talk to me about her experience with her son and a gaming addiction. She has written a book entitled Seeing Through the Cracks and now does speaking events on this topic. Elaine, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So tell me, how did this start? How did you get involved in speaking about gaming addiction? So I, well, actually initially, I wanted to write a book about the transition between parenting your child and parenting your adult child. And as I was considering writing that book, uh, we discovered that my son had a video gaming addiction um, while he was at university. Um, and so, and it took me by surprise because I was raising my boys during the 90s and into the millennium and uh, gaming was something new and exciting and we were all really seduced by the progression of technology and what it could offer and we were told that you know it was educational and it would help with hand-eye coordination and uh, it was fun and, and recreational and really the only restrictions that we needed to be made aware of was uh, keeping kids safe from online predators, so keeping their, their personal information private, and making sure they were choosing age-appropriate games. And so I really thought I had all that covered, and, um, and discovered later that when my son was uh, leaving his uh, primary school and going into a new middle school for a specialized program, he really didn't feel like he fit in. He, didn't, he couldn't find a way to get into the inner circle that was already in existence at the school and uh, so felt really ostracized and isolated and so he at that time started online gaming to sort of find his own little tribe of you know gamers that understood how he felt and and friendships that he could make online uh, and so you know he, he did talk about his online friends he we, we did have conversations about it but I didn't realize that you know he was really escaping into that world and and not living in the world outside of the virtual screen time. Wow, so now he, when once he reaches university, you find out that this has been, in retrospect, you realize sort of when it started and how it started. Right. And now you're dealing with a son who is, has a gaming addiction. What does that look like? Like, when you say gaming addiction, how bad was it? So he went into first year, he finished, he told us everything was good. Uh, in fact, he took us out for a celebratory dinner and uh, we later learned that it wasn't. So it had already started in first year. He uh, entered the university feeling quite smart, um, coming out of a gifted program, and then learned that there were children that were, well, students that were much smarter, and so he started to lack his own confidence in himself as a student and started to gain more. Um, so he came home for the summer, he worked, and then he went back to school and um, he started communicating a lot less. When we did see him, I'd notice his weight was dropping. I noticed that he had a, an odor, his hair was greasy, his skin was starting to break out. Every time I asked him questions about it, of course he had an answer. He um, chalked everything up to you know, being busy at school. And I sort of lied to myself as well because I didn't know what I was looking for. Right. And, uh, and then two months in, uh, to second year, I, I got an email from him, and he had literally been gaming all night, sleeping all day. He hadn't attended a class for two months, and he's six foot two. He weighed 127 pounds. Uh, the skin was broken out. He was he had tremors. Um, his eyes were dilated all the time. He stopped grooming, so thus the the odor. Um, so he really looked. He looked like an addict. Wow. And I was caught off guard again because I couldn't imagine that you could have symptoms like that from video gaming. Right. And because he wasn't at home, you were kind of in the no news is good news kind of thinking, haven't heard from him, so I assume everything's well, not knowing that this is getting progressively worse and severe. Right. Because he wasn't under your own roof. So right. So you weren't seeing this. Well, he could hide it really well. And, you know, addicts do become great manipulators. They don't want to give it up. They'll lie to keep it. Right. Um, but I did start to feel like he was pulling away. And I even actually sent him a, a text saying, are you even attending classes? Because you appeared to be a bit of a night hawk because he would be answering my texts at 3 a.m. Hmm. And it was just a matter of days after that that I, I got the email. Wow. Mm -hmm. So 
it's come to the point where he hasn't attended a class in a couple of months. He's not, self-care is, you know, non-existent. Um, so what do you do? What, what happened? We brought then? him home and uh, first I took him to the doctors to make sure he was okay um, health-wise. Um, he was diagnosed with extreme depression and anxiety at that time. Um, he did start seeing a counselor right away. It wasn't an addiction therapy specific counselor, but he did have eight weeks of counseling. Uh, we changed his uh, timing so he was awake during the day. His sleep awake cycle was changed. I put him on a very healthy diet um, and not a diet to lose weight, but a he right. healthier weight program. Um, I took him to fitness classes to get him exercising to hope that would help. Um, help him with the mental health aspect. All gaming was removed from the home, uh, so it was really a cold turkey withdrawal for him. Wow. It was painful, painful physically, painful mentally, and as well, we had taken away his entire social circle. Right. Yeah. So, but he, he must have been ready for this or wanting he it. He wanted the help. He didn't want to admit that it was an addiction, though. He okay. just wanted to be treated for depression and anxiety. But because he was gaming all night and sleeping all day, that did have to be given up for him to start taking a look at the emotional issues that he needed to address. Wow. So how long from the time you, you know, find out it's a severe, you bring him home, how long before you started seeing changes? You, changes in terms of? Of like him breaking the cycle of this addiction. Well, he didn't really break it. I mean, he got through the eight weeks. We took him back for second semester because we'd learned that first semester had been a disaster and he actually failed three courses. So we suggested that he go back if he was ready and pick up those three courses so he didn't lose the entire year. Um, we dropped him off at residence and he turned the computer on and loaded the game thinking that he could just play for one hour and one hour led into two hours, and then he hadn't gone to a class for a week. At that and point, I started to really pay attention to that gut feeling again that I was having before, right. and so we so drove to the school. Like another relapse. He had a total relapse. Yeah. So we'll pick up more on that when we come back from the break. Welcome back. Today we're talking about gaming addictions. My guest Elaine Yuskowski has first-hand experience with this as she's been assisting her son heal his gaming disorder. It has been a challenging time for Elaine and her husband and now Elaine is reaching out to help others, other parents who find themselves struggling with their child's screen addiction. So Elaine, you were talking about your son before the break about how he had a relapse. Right. He goes back to university and he thinks he'll be okay. He'll just play a game yep. and then it turns into an extended period of time again. Yeah, another week okay. of gaming before we, we went and checked on him. I don't know how much longer it would have gone otherwise. I think it's kind of like the alcoholic that thinks they can have one drink. He mm. thought he could play for an hour. Right. So we brought him home again and, uh, and we had a long conversation and I tried to really understand. I didn't want to come down hard on him because I knew he had the anxiety, I knew he had the depression and I so I really wanted to get to the core of you know, what the issue was. Um, and then I asked him, what is it that you need? What do you need now? And he said, I need you to drive me to school and walk me to class until I can do it on my own. If you take me back, I will game again. Mm -hmm. So he knew he couldn't self-regulate. Right. So thank goodness he had that self-awareness right. that he needed that much support. Right. Right. So. Where did you go from there? So you ended I up... I drove him. You, you did all those things? For weeks, yeah. You're and then when he was ready to do it on his own, uh, he was required a full accountability. He had to take photographs of himself in the lecture room or in the classroom, email it to me so I knew he was actually in class, and then he would come home every weekend. That got us through that semester. And then the next year, he lived with a family friend in Guelph. So there was a little, and he still came home on weekends. He came home on weekends throughout. Um, this past year was his fifth year, and he actually lived with us. We downsized and moved closer to the where the university is, and so he actually lived with us for the last year and had full support. 
So from the time you found out till now, is it, you know, four years has... has three years. Three? Mm -hmm. And he has needed support through that whole three years. He has, yeah. yeah. Is he still needing your support? He's um, finished school. He's moving out uh, to Toronto because he has a full-time job now. And um, he's, he's ready to... He's been 11 months detox fully from gaming. He, it took him two years to admit that he had an addiction, first of all. And once he admitted it, then it's kind of like I remember Robert Downey Jr., who had a drug and alcohol problem, said, you know, uh, deciding was the difficult part. But, you know, the actual leaving the drugs and alcohol behind wasn't difficult once he decided. So for Jake, once he decided, he was willing to put in the work at that point. And I would say in the last month, he's told me that the desire to game is no longer on the register. Uh, he doesn't, and he realizes now that he can never game again. Right. Um, he made all kinds of new friends at school. He got involved in activities outside of the, the classroom. He started doing more sports again. So he found ways to replace that dopamine high that right. the video game. That's what I was just going to say. It's not about eliminating a behavior as much as it's about replacing. Replacing it. Yeah. Right. And so. replacing the social aspect of it as well. Right. Yeah. He got counseling at the school as well. The University of Guelph were fantastic. They provide him a counselor and a special needs advisor. So he had support there as well. Right. So what would you say, so in hindsight, you feel like he was very susceptible to this because he was feeling sort of socially outcast. Yeah. So as parents, we really want to pay attention if we're you know, noticing that our children aren't really, you know, interacting well with peers or not having many social, you know, interactions or relationships with um, with other people, that they're going to turn and find this sort of easy way. Yeah, to they, have a, they could, certainly, yeah. Uh, with a gaming addiction. Mm -hmm. Because they're still, they're interacting, they're interacting with yeah. people through a screen. Yeah, and he believed those were his real friends. You know, I was not allowed to say they're not your real friends because, you know, to him they were his real friends. They were people and he was globally connecting with them. Right. So what do you want parents then to, to know when you're creating this awareness? What's the biggest part of the awareness that you're sharing? Uh, to be paying attention to the, the signs and the symptoms, changes in mood, changes in sleep patterns, um, you know, the, the spending more time on the computer, them getting angry if you want to take the computer away or ask them to leave the computer at any time. Um, I mean, you need to start looking for those things. That's the awareness aspect of it. But if you do have uh, a child or an adult child that you think is uh, addicted to video gaming, they can't self-regulate. They cannot walk away from that on their own. They absolutely need your support and your help and your understanding. So to realize too that if you have children, teens or older, still you need to you know touch base and be parent. engaged as a parent. Absolutely. It's not eat like your meals at the table. Right. Yeah. Have uh, non-screen times. If you think there's uh, issues, you know, disconnect the internet when it's bedtime. Um, when you're in the car traveling, make sure it's a screen-free time so that you can communicate with each other. Yeah. Yeah, screen-free. So really schedule in screen-free times. Yeah. Also, I think what's important is, you know, parents keep their kids so busy now with uh, activities outside of school, they're not really giving them any downtime or any time to go hang with their friends. You know, they're hanging with kids at school, they may not necessarily be their close friends depending on their schedule, especially in high school. You know, then they're going off and they're hanging with the kids that they're doing whatever activity, like dancing or, or sports, and then they go home to homework, and then they kind of want to connect to their friends then, and it's late at night, and mm -hmm. so we need to allow for you know, less busyness and more time for them to connect with their friends, even if it is online, because that's not going away. Kids right. are going to con continue connecting online. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I'm hearing that kids are up until, you know, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning because they're just hungry for that time to spend with friends. Right. Well, we'll continue this interesting discussion we, when we come back from the break. with me Elaine Yuskowski, author of a book, Seeing Through the Cracks. Something she discusses in this book is her son's gaming addiction, and she is here with me today to talk about balancing and regulating screen time with children. 
up until now we've been talking more about sort of teen and, and young 20s age group but let's even talk about you know younger children because now the parents today are dealing with uh, having to deal with screen time with really young children yeah. so what would you say or recommend you know parents do as far as you know regulating time or what would your suggestions be around screen time so so in terms of the pediatric uh, recommendation, recommendations that's the word I'm looking for sorry uh, they suggest no screen time from the age of uh, birth to uh, two and then uh, from two to preteen it's one hour a day and uh, teenagers it's two hours a day and that doesn't include homework time on screen so that's just recreational, recreational screen time. time and I already know even from my own I, I have four kids myself and I'm sure that they surpass that uh, you know, a huge amount. I think that. most most adults, most parents are too. Right. We're spending a lot of time on our iPhones. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We need to be role modeling what we want Absolutely. our kids doing for sure. Right. Are we putting the phone down for meal time? Are we putting the phone down right. uh, to interact and talk? Um, yeah. And the more time you spend on your phone as a parent, and the more your child sees how drawn in you are by it, the more they want that. Mm. Right. And so they see that as a way of feeding themselves too. Like, sure. you know, a lot of parents are, you know, checking into their social media or checking in to see who's paying attention to me and and right. so then and disengaging from and parenting. disengaging from their own family members. Right. 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 And we were talking during the break too about how with younger children in particular there's a real concern about physiologically rewiring right. kids. We are changing the brains of our children if we're giving them uh, technology before the age of two. So, you know, there, I'm hearing about parents who are sending their children to bed to uh, read their own story, have their story read to them on an, an iPad and s instead of the parent sitting with a book and reading. And so then you're removing that ability for a child to have an interaction with another human being and, and hear inflection and emotion and a voice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if, then if the screen is doing the job for the child, um, if they have to just touch a button and everything's done for them, you then take away the ability for that child to think for themselves and figure it out themselves and be more imaginative and creative. Right, and even just having that lack of human interaction. I mean, I think of story time when my kids were little. Um, it was cuddle time, too. Yeah. It wasn't just about reading yeah. a book. It was interacting. Right. And I think, too, I mean, I also teach part-time, and I'm seeing more and more, and I think any of the elementary school teachers out there will see, will agree with me that we're seeing more and more children coming into kindergarten uh, really sort of antsy, inattentive, you know, and, and actually demonstrating what I would call drug-addictive behavior, right. almost like to the point of twitching, like right. they're, they need the screen time. It's been taken away. The drug is gone, and where's their next hit? Right. How are they going to get it? And then they end up sort of physically, you know, acting out. You know, they can't sit still. They have to kind of be moving around the room. They're, right. you know, and I think a lot of this, you know, we're dealing with it, uh, you know, a lot more. And I think a lot of that's coming from, you know, screen time that came at a young age, and now they're expected to come to school all day and not have, you know, minimal screen time, and they just don't know how to handle it. So what would you say then is happening to these little, you know, young children, preschoolers, kindergartners that co are coming in with this addiction or this behavior? Or this behavior. And the behavior sounds like withdrawal symptoms that they're having, right? They're leaving the screen time from home and then not allow being allowed. The research now is showing, um, because the child's frontal lobe of the brain doesn't fully develop until they're 25 years old, so there's constant development and growth happening there. And uh, they're showing now that uh, excessive screen time is changing the brain to the point where it is now mimicking neurological disorders such as anxiety, depression, ADD, OCD. And so now we've reached the stage where is this someone who has ADD or anxiety or, or is it being exacerbated by the, um, the screen time addiction? or was it already there mildly and it's making it worse. In my son's case, um, he, was, he had been diagnosed with ADHD at age 19 when we took him to the doctor as well. And so um, that was, he was treated for that. And um, when he finally detoxed, within six months of detoxing, the symptoms of that started to show as much, much less and he didn't feel he needed to take anything for it anymore. The anxiety was much less, the depression was manageable. Um, 
he had ticks, the ticks completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. Wow. So really, I mean, I'm thinking of parents watching, and as a parent myself, I, you know, I'm already thinking, what am I going to do with this information? And I think it's just a real wake-up call, you know, this is an awakening of we need to continue, or if you haven't already, be a very conscious parent. Right. Like when you're in the job of parenting, you cannot sleep at the wheel. No. And, and not from a play, place of being intrusive right. or invasive. It's just about being conscious of, right. are you spending time with them? Are you inviting them to uh, have uh, less screen time and invite them the skill of how to self-regulate right. and role modeling that? Right. You know, and that's what I see, you know, happening all the time is families at a restaurant and, you know, mom and dad are on their device and the little one has an iPad and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, the whole idea of coming to not only feed our, cell, our bodies but feed ourselves emotionally is being lost. Sure. And, and so that's, I think, number one message that I personally want to get across is that we really need to make sure through this digital age that we stay conscious as parents. I think too we probably need to add to that uh, that if your child is struggling inside uh, they need to have an outlet to talk about that and it's not the internet that is not where that should be so we also need to give our kids in, uh, permission to come to us and in a judgmental place and, and speak about the, the troubles that they're having so that they don't go looking for it elsewhere. Great. So Elaine, how can the viewers get a hold of you either to book you for a speaking event or um, to get a copy of your book? So they can find the link to the book uh, on my website, which is elaineuskowski.com, and they can contact me as well through the website because uh, I'm mostly speaking through schools uh, to therapists, teachers, uh, parents, students. Great, great. Yeah. Well, Elaine, thank you for coming in, sharing your story with us. Thank you for bringing awareness to this so that we can remember as parents to be, that we need to wake up and be more conscious. It's a, it's a very valuable message. And thank you for joining us on our journey of Awakening Within.